Dear friends, welcome to the next topic of study in the ongoing course in journalism and mass communication. In the courses for the second semester, the areas we shall take up now include media law and ethics. Media ethics deals with the specific ethical principles and standards of the media including broadcast, print and entertainment media. It now also includes the internet. The field covers many varied and highly controversial topics ranging from misleading or one-sided reporting, portrayal of obscenity and violence, suggestive advertising, political and commercial interests of media houses and journalists, duties and responsibilities of journalists, conflicts of interest, war journalism and the recent phenomena of paid news. Every journalist and journalism student, whether studying traditional print media or the modern convergent media, must know the legal and ethical aspects of publishing a story. There are two main aspects of media regulations. The first is the media laws about the publication of a story which may relate to label and defamation and the second is about the media laws about permissible comments on legal proceedings including contempt of court and also proceedings of parliament that is contempt of parliament. A journalist must also make ethical choices about each story apart from its possible legal implications. The ethics of journalism is one of the most well-defined branches of media ethics. Journalistic ethics tend to dominate media ethics sometimes almost to the exclusion of other areas. The main subjects covered by journalism ethics include the following. Number one, manipulation of news. News can manipulate and be manipulated by anyone who is or considers himself to be powerful enough. Governments and private corporations alike may attempt to manipulate news media. Governments, for example, by censorship and corporations by share ownership or advertising pressure. The methods of manipulation are subtle and many. Manipulation may be voluntary or involuntary. Those being manipulated at times may not be aware of the fact that they are being manipulated. Number two, the issue of truth. Truth may conflict with many other values because a government or a commercial organization may at times not be interested in people knowing the truth. This can lead to ethical conflicts. Number three, public interest. Revelation of classified government or military secrets and other sensitive government information, even if it is true, may be contrary to public interest or so the government or the bureaucracy might believe. However, public interest is not a term which is easy to define since governments of all the kind, whether it's a democratic setup or not, always take shelter behind the issue of so-called public interest when they do not want to reveal certain information. The next is the issue of privacy. Unsavory or private details of the lives of public figures are central content, especially in entertainment media. Publication is not necessarily justified simply because the information is true. Privacy is also a right and a right which conflicts with free speech. Taste. Photojournalists may often confront situations which may shock the sensitivities of their audiences. For example, visuals of severely injured or deceased people, human remains, filth, 
etc. are rarely screened or published. The ethical issue is how far should one risk shocking an audience's sensitivities in order to correctly and fully report the truth. The next aspect is conflict with the law. Journalistic ethics may conflict with the law over issues such as protection of confidential sources. There is also the question of the extent to which it is ethically acceptable to break the law in order to obtain news. The recent trend of having sting operations with hidden cameras, undercover reporters going to the extent of moving around with fictitious identities and many other similar situations are examples of this conflict. For this reason, many believe that ethics in journalism is actually an impossible situation that can never be applied in practice. In fact, some practitioners of journalism believe that the very nature of journalism that is to report what is going on within the establishment and to bring it before the eyes of the public may involve and certainly it does involve contravening certain laws using certain tactics which might not be truly legal. And of course they might not be ethical at times but again that is the only way news can be extracted from sources. So in countries with a democratic system of governance the relationship between the media and the government is very special. The freedom of the media may be enshrined in the constitution and have precise legal definition and enforcement, the exercise of that freedom by individual journalists is a matter of personal choice and application of ethics. Modern democratic government subsists in representation of millions by hundreds. For the representatives to be accountable and for the process of the government to be transparent, effective communication paths must exist to their constituents. Today these paths consist primarily of the mass media to the extent that if press freedom disappeared, so would most political accountability. In this area, media ethics merges with the issue of civil rights and politics. The press is one of the primary guardians in a democratic society of many of the freedoms, rights and duties discussed by other fields of applied ethics. In media ethics, the ethical obligations of the guardians themselves come more strongly into the foreground. Who guards the guardians? This question also arises in the field of legal ethics. A further self-referentiality or circular characteristics in the media ethics is the questioning of its own values. Meta issues can become identical with the subject matter of media ethics. This is most strongly seen when artistic elements are considered. Another characteristic of media ethics is the disparate nature of its goals. Ethical dilemmas emerge when goals conflict. The goals of media usage diverge sharply. Media usage may be subject to pressures to maximize economic profits, entertainment value, information provision, the upholding of democratic freedoms, the development of art and culture, fame and of course vanity. So what is the role of government and business in this whole issue of media ethics? In recent years, the increasing commercialization of the mass media has also had some adverse effects on journalistic practices. When media establishments come to be preoccupied with the size of their readership or viewership 
or circulation, there is an increased likelihood of journalists using intrusive news gathering methods and editors approving of content where facts are often not verified or reported without explaining their proper background. This tendency of resorting to undue sensationalism or reporting only one side's viewpoint is especially worrying given the central role of the mass media in a democratic setup. In many ways, the conduct of journalism and politics in a free society is inherently interlinked. Without the free flow of information and opinions, individuals and groups cannot form the rational choices which are ultimately translated into public policies and governmental action. The essential components of politics, that is representation, legislation and administration, all depend on how information is exchanged between the citizens and the government as well as between citizens themselves. Very often some statements and actions come to gain meaning only on account of the publicity given to them. At the time of the French Revolution, the press was described as the fourth state in the political establishment. In our times, the expanding reach of newspapers, television, radio and the internet have made the media an even stronger pillar of our political existence. At present, India is one of the few countries where the markets for the print media as well as the electronic media and digital media have been continuously growing. As more and more Indians become literate and gain access to television and computers, there is also a commensurate responsibility on the news media establishments to present accurate and balanced reports. The freedom of the press is an extension of the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression provided for under Article 19.1a of the Constitution. In our times, ideas and information reach the masses largely to the extent that they are permitted entry into the prominent dailies and news magazines and other media. With the concentration of the mass media in a few hands, the chances of an idea which is antagonistic to the interests of the proprietors of big newspapers getting access to the market becomes remote. The news media cannot possibly support the public's right to know when there is no acceptance of a duty to inform. To the press, the public's right to know extends only to what the press decides or elects to tell. There can be no doubt that any mass medium having the greatest circulation would influence the political life of the country because the ideas for which a prominent paper stands have the greatest chance of being circulated among the widest section of the public. It will affect the economic pattern of the society. The integrity of the news becomes a matter of profound social concern. There is also an affirmative obligation on the part of the government not to abridge the freedom of expression or to allow monopolization by any party in the mass media. Our vibrant democracy survives to a great extent by the contribution made by the newspapers. The rights of millions of people who have no scope or opportunity to raise their voice should be given a voice in the mass media. It is said that the victories of freedom of speech must be won in the minds of the people before they are won in courts. There are different perceptions about issues related to the media. 
The question of ethics in media is all about how people in general, especially those who are affected by the media's work, perceive the media and its way of working. The point is that everyone acknowledges that the fundamental objective of journalism is to serve the people with news, views, comments and information on matters of public interest in a fair, accurate, unbiased and decent manner and language. Towards this end, everyone appreciates the role of the media unless and until the probing eyes, ears and hands of the media do not reach the doors of those very people who have so far been the strongest supporters of the media's freedom. Whenever there is an example of how the media or media persons have erred in performing their duty, there are two sides to the story. One is that those having a grouse against the media and terming it as lacking in ethics are very often those who had at one time or the other sought the help of the media in turning the situation in their favor. The second is that the media person overreaches or overreacts in his enthusiasm, confusion, miscalculation or indeed singular self-interest to write something that is blatantly unethical. This can happen when 1. The identity and confidentiality of a source is revealed. 2. The information conveyed to the journalist in good faith is used with some other intention. 3. The media person intentionally writes something that is one-sided, incomplete or incorrect in order to help someone with or without receiving some benefit in cash or kind from those who stand to gain from such a report. Number 4. The media person intentionally or otherwise invades the privacy of an individual during the course of work. All the situations mentioned here cover largely the issues arising out of the broader issues of media ethics. As is evident from these situations, the issue of ethical practice of media activity has to be constantly ensured at two levels. One is at the level of the journalists themselves who must maintain guard against pressures from different quarters, be vigilant in their own work so as to ensure that their reports are error-free and desist from giving in to allurements. The other level is at the level of the establishment comprising the government and the corporate sector. These two sections have to ensure that journalists are not persuaded to write a report that is favorable or otherwise following suggestions, allurements, threats or any other unfair incentives. It must be remembered that if such a thing happens once, it can happen again. And very soon the establishment that earlier very merrily collaborated in getting favorable reports might become a victim of the same happening at the hands of the same or the other set of journalists. In a country like ours, where there is extreme corruption at all levels and the govern government machinery is slow to react to situations, the media is a boon. With the people's anger and frustration over corruption getting deeper, the ruling establishment often resorts to sudden spurts of activity to give an impression of being responsive to the situation. However, the role of the media is always more important in not only highlighting the problem but later in also showing how inadequate the official response has been. Hence, a free and independent media is our country's best hope. If the public benefits as a result of a specific investigative method, then it is justified. In recent years, 
The sting operations have exposed many murky and sordid happenings in public offices and behavior of government, political and otherwise important functionaries. However, the establishment very often first tries to shrug off the charges as being of little consequence or worse a blame game starts to shift responsibility from one minion to the other so that the initial public anger dissipates and the response can be easily mired in procedural wrangling. The people are subject to the usual allegations of frame ups unseen forces maligning their names and character and so on and so forth. The media in recent years have been actively engaged in exposing cases of blatant misuse of power and following it up. Some examples being the investigations in the infamous Jessica Lal, Nitish Katara and Priyadarshini Mattu cases of New Delhi. However, there is this proverbial other side of the coin. Due to stiff competition, some news channels try to project different perceptions in certain sensational stories. For instance, when the forest brigand Virappan was killed in police encounter, a certain news channel went to the extent of nearly whipping up sympathy for him by telling their audience to remember the brigand's wife and kids at this time and try to be sensitive to them. Media is a powerful tool in India and has to be used with care, caution and responsibility. Certainly, the responsible media by far outweighs a few stray self-serving cases. Even though the media takes up cudgels for causes, the rise of citizen journalism has given more strength to an already powerful tool. The reversal of roles from audience to collecting, reporting, analyzing and publishing news armed with cell phone cameras and digital cameras has actually lent power to citizens. It is also essential for the attainment of human rights. Citizen journalism is yet another step closer to a more transparent and accountability in government and public sectors. The international scenario regarding media ethics goes like this. It was in 1948 that the United Nations made the universal declaration of human rights laying down certain freedoms for the mankind. Article 19 of the declaration enunciates the most basic of these freedoms which says, quote, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, unquote. The right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek and receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. In India, Article 19A of the Constitution guarantees to the citizen the right to freedom of speech and expression. The press is considered an indispensable pillar of democracy. It pervades public opinion and shapes it. Parliamentary democracy can flourish only under the watchful eyes of the media. Media not only reports but also acts as a bridge between the state and the public. At a time when globalization of Indian economy has brought about drastic changes in the media scenario, and the Indian press is also going global. The responsibility of the press to safeguard the interest of the people and the nation has increased manifold. With the advent of private TV channels, the media seems to have reached every corner of the lives of the people and society in every walk of life. Such is the influence of the media that it can make or unmake any individual. Or any institution or any thought. But at the same time, journalism is a profession that serves. By virtue thereof, it enjoys the privilege to question others. This privilege 
includes the right to collect information from primary authentic sources which are of use and importance to the society or the nation and then report the same in an unbiased and positive way with the aim to inform and not to create sensation and harm the public. Any direct or indirect interference from the state, the owner or the other sector of the government and society is actually an encroachment on its freedom to discharge its duties towards the society. However, to enjoy these privileges, the media must follow certain ethics in collecting and disseminating information. These include ensuring authenticity of news, use of restrained and socially acceptable language for ensuring objectivity, fairness in reporting and keeping in mind its cascading effects on the society. Also, its effect on individuals and institutions concerned has to be kept in mind. While freedom of expression is no doubt a fundamental right, it has to be broadly guided and bound by societal duties and ethics. This involves a sensitive balancing act to protect the rights of the individuals while exercising the right of expression. So ethics is a code of values which governs our lives and thus are very essential for moral and healthy living. In the context of the press, ethics may be described as a set of moral principles or values which guide the conduct of journalism. So the ethics are essentially the self-restraint to be practiced by the journalists voluntarily to preserve and promote the trust of the people and to maintain their own credibility and not betray the faith and confidence of the people. While journalists in the United States and European countries have led in the formulation and adoption of codes of practice, such codes now can be found in news reporting organizations in most countries which have a free press. The written codes and practical standards vary somewhat from country to country and organization to organization, but there is a substantial overlap among mainstream publications and societies. The International Federation of Journalists, a global organization of journalists from nearly all the free and democratic countries, launched a global ethical journalism initiative in the year 2008 aimed at strengthening awareness of these issues within professional bodies. The primary themes common to most codes of journalistic standards and ethics are as follows. 1. Accuracy and standards for factual reporting. It means that reporters are expected to be as accurate as possible given the time allotted to story preparation and the space available and to seek reliable sources. Events with a single eyewitness are reported with attribution to that person. Events with two or more independent eyewitnesses may be reported as fact. Controversial facts are reported with attribution always. Independent fact checking by another employee of the publisher or a colleague in the newsroom is always desirable. Corrections are published when errors are discovered and need to be owned by the newspaper organization. Defendants at trial are treated only as having allegedly committed the crimes until they are convicted when their crimes are generally reported as a fact which has taken place. Opinion surveys and statistical information deserve special treatment to communicate in precise terms any conclusions to contextualize the results and to specify accuracy 
including estimated error and methodological criticism or flaws. Plus, such results of surveys and statistics must always be attributed to the organization or the team that has conducted those surveys. Second is slander and libel considerations. Reporting the truth is almost never defamatory, which makes accuracy very important. Private persons having privacy laws and rights that must be balanced against the public interest in reporting information about them is something which has to be practiced by journalists at all levels. Number three, the harm limitation principle. During the normal course of an assignment, a reporter might go about gathering facts and details, conducting interviews, doing research, background checks, taking photos, videotaping, recording sound. Such harm limitation deals with the questions of whether everything learned should be reported and if yes, then how. The principle of limitation means that some weight needs to be given to the negative consequences of full disclosure, creating a practical and, of course, ethical dilemma. The Society of Professional Journalists, another international organization, has come up with a code of ethics which offers this advice. Show compassion for those who may be affected adversely by the news coverage. Use special sensitivity when dealing with children and inexperienced sources or subjects. Be sensitive when seeking or using interviews or photographs of those affected by tragedy or grief. Recognize that gathering and reporting information may cause harm or discomfort to certain people. Pursuit of news is not and never a license for arrogance. Recognize that private people have a greater right to control information about themselves than do public officials and others who seek power, influence or attention. Only an overriding public need can justify intrusion into anyone's privacy. Show good taste. Avoid pandering to lurid curiosity. Be cautious about identifying juvenile suspects or victim of sex crimes. Be judicious about naming criminal suspects before the formal filing of charges. Balance a criminal suspect's fair trial rights with the public's right to be informed and the police or the investigating agencies exercise to come out with every detail that might help them in prosecution. The next point is regarding taste, decency and acceptability. Audiences have different reactions to depictions of violence, nudity, coarse language or to people in any other situation that is unacceptable to or stigmatized by the local culture or laws such as the consumption of alcohol, homosexuality, illegal drug use, etc. Even with similar audiences, Different organizations and even individual reporters have different standards and practices. These decisions often revolve around what facts are necessary for the audience to know. Only such facts need to be disclosed while others can very well be kept away from the report because they don't affect the basic import, import of the report. When certain distasteful or shocking material is considered important to the story, there are a variety of common methods for mitigating negative audience reaction. Advance warning 
of explicit or disturbing material may allow listeners or readers to avoid content they would rather not be exposed to offensive words may be partially obscured or bleeped potentially offensive images may be blurred or narrowly cropped descriptions may be substituted for pictures graphic detail might be omitted disturbing content might be moved from a cover to an inside page or from daytime to late evening telecast when children are less likely to be watching it there is often considerable controversy over these techniques especially concerned that obscuring or not reporting certain facts or details is self censorship that compromises objectivity and fidelity to the truth and which does not serve the public interest for example images and graphic descriptions of war are often violent bloody shocking and profoundly tragic this makes certain content disturbing to some audience members but it is precisely these aspects of war that some consider to be the most important to be conveyed some argue that sanitizing the depiction of war influences public opinion about the merits of continuing the fight and about the policies or circumstances that initially precipitated the conflict the amount of explicit violence and mutilation depicted in war coverage varies considerably from time to time from organization to organization from country to country and of course from individual to individual reporters have also been accused of indecency in the process of collecting news namely that they are overly intrusive in the name of journalistic insensitivity the next point is campaigning in the media many print publications take advantage of their wide readership and print persuasive pieces in the form of unsigned editorials that represent <coughs> the official position of the organization despite the ostensible separation between editorial writing and news gathering this practice may cause some people to doubt the political objectivity of the publication's news reporting <clears throat> although usually unsigned editorials are accompanied by a diversity of signed opinions from other perspectives one particularly controversial question is whether media organizations should endorse political candidates for office or during any election political endorsements create more opportunities to construe favoritism in reporting and can create a perceived conflict of interest the next topic is about investigative methods investigative journalism is largely an information gathering exercise looking for facts that are not easy to obtain by simple requests and searches or are actively being concealed suppressed or distorted anonymous sources are double edged they often provide especially newsworthy information such as classified or confidential documents and information about current events information about a previously unreported scandal or the perspective of a particular group that may fear retribution for expressing certain opinions in the press the downside is that the condition of anonymity may make it difficult or impossible for the reporter to verify the sources statements sometimes sources hide their identities from the public because their statements would otherwise quickly be discredited thus 
statements attributed to anonymous sources may carry more credibility than when they are attributed to someone. Some questions that often arise in the course of a reporter's duty are as follows. Is it ethical to make an appointment to interview an arsonist sought by the police without informing the police in advance of the interview? Is lack of proper attribution equated to plagiarism or copying? Should a reporter write a story about a local priest who confessed to a crime if it will cost the newspaper readers and advertisers who are sympathetic to the priest? Is it ethical for a reporter to write a news piece on the same topic on which he or she has written an opinion piece in the same paper? Under what circumstances do you identify a person who was arrested as a relative of a public figure such as a local sports star or a local celebrity? Freelance journalists and photographers accept cash to write about or take photos of events with the promise of attempting to get their work on either the news outlets or get it printed in some news organizations from which they will also be paid. Is that ethical? Can a journalist reveal a source of information after guaranteeing confidentiality if the source proves to be unreliable? And of course, can a source be revealed if the matter reaches a court of law? So there has to be some common ground in terms of an acceptable court and the media all over the world have voluntarily accepted such a code of ethics which should cover at least the following areas of conduct. Number one, honesty and fairness. Number two, duty to seek the views on the subject of any critical reportage in advance of publication. Number three, duty to correct factual errors. Number four, duty not to falsify pictures or to use them in a misleading fashion. Number five, duty to provide an opportunity to reply to critical opinions as well as to critical factual reportage. Number six, appearance as well as reality of objectivity. Number seven, respect for privacy. Number eight, duty to distinguish between facts and opinion. Number nine, duty not to discriminate or to inflame hatred on such grounds as race, nationality, religion or gender. Number ten, some codes call on the press to refrain from mentioning the race, religion or nationality of the subject of news stories unless it is relevant to the story, while some others call for coverage which promotes tolerance. Number 11, a duty not to use dishonest means to obtain information. Number 12, a duty not to endanger people. Number 13, maintaining general standards of decency and taste. And number 14, duty not to prejudge the guilt of an accused and to publish the dismissal of charges against or acquittal of anyone about whom the paper obviously had reported that charges had been filed or that a trial had commenced. Some codes also prohibit members of the press from receiving gifts in the course of their news gathering activity. Now let us check out on some specific situations when the media has to face challenges on ethical issues. Coverage of elections is one major situation. Most of the ethical and professional issues that journalists will encounter in covering elections will be variants of what they confront in their everyday working lives. However, these issues and dilemmas may present themselves in particular ways during elections. Some examples of such professional dilemmas include the following. 1. 
newsworthiness versus balanced coverage news coverage is driven by considerations of what is distinct and therefore of particular interest in an event yet the people would like a fair and balanced presentation of the manifestos and agendas of the different parties which may be far from distinct or interesting how can the media reconcile their news function with their public service function number 2 transparency versus the integrity of the election process one of the reasons that the media play an essential role in democratic elections is that they are able to subject the election process to scrutiny and expose any malpractice however proper administration of an election also depends on security and confidentiality balancing these two elements is an issue for lawmakers and those responsible for drawing up electoral regulations but it is also a day to day practical issue for journalists themselves so if the election process is having integrity then it has to be confidential then how transparent can its reporting be done next is reporting inflammatory speeches the paradox is that election campaigns other times when politicians are most likely to express extreme and inflammatory sentiments with the chance of these reaching large audiences there are also the time when these are most likely to have a negative impact but also the time when expression of differing political views is most important the regulatory implications of this dilemma are for policy makers to resolve for journalists the challenge is to report inflammatory political speech in a manner that is both accurate and least likely to provoke violence or fear journalism is now frequently described as a profession and many journalists are proud to be considered professionals other journalists regard their calling as a trade rather than a profession like medicine or the law whatever the conclusion on this point however there seems to be a general agreement that the practice of journalism needs to be regulated by a professional or ethical code of conduct codes of conduct may be promulgated by associations or unions of journalists by media houses individually or collectively or by regulatory bodies such codes are most effective if they are the outcome of a collective process in which journalists and editors themselves participate there are overreaching codes of conduct such as that agreed by the international federation of journalists as mentioned earlier this enunciates several principles that will be relevant to journalists in election coverage such as accuracy impartiality honesty and resistance to corruption avoiding the use of language or sentiments that promote violence or discrimination and correction of inaccurate factual reporting it is often advisable to develop a code of conduct that covers issues specific to elections these might include reporting of opinion poll findings reporting of political rallies and other campaign events using exit polls reporting the counting and the result needless to say the heat of the moment as well as the journalists own political affiliation or soft corner would play a role in the manner in which the entire election process is reported and the jubilation or disappointments at the outcome as the case may be could reflect in the mood of the report that is written it must be remembered that alert readers can make out 
that the reporter or the writer has infused some personal views or sentiment in the election coverage and that is why charges of political affiliation are very easily labeled on newspapers and their reporters before and during the election. In Indian context, coverage of elections whether to the state assemblies or to parliament Lok Sabha elections that is are very often given the color of being guided by certain political forces, political parties or even the political leaders. It is also very easy to level the allegations that the ruling party at either the central level or at the state level is using the official machinery and the official allurements to impact the coverage of the election in those areas where the ruling party is either in a dominant position or it is not likely to make any substantive gains. In fact, such pressures are very common for journalists to face in every kind of elections whether it is a general election or even a small low level city level election. The freedom of the press has to be preserved and protected not only from outside interference but equally from those within. An internal mechanism for adherence to guidelines is sought to be ensured through mechanisms such as letters to the editor, internal ombudsman in the media houses, the press council, the media watch groups which keep track of lapses committed by the media persons, journalists or even the media house managements. These measures not only ensure the accountability of the media and act as a break on the arbitrary and unbridled use of power but also help to enhance the credibility of the press. These ethics are not in the nature of control on the press but are necessary for fair and objective use of the press for maintaining freedom of speech and expression in true spirit. The mandate of the Press Council of India as well as similar bodies across the world is to specifically promote the standards of the media by building up for it a code of conduct. It is to be appreciated that our legislation very wisely did not entrust on the council the task of laying down a code of conduct. For ethics cannot be mired down in a straight jacket and ethics cannot be enforced by a government or a bureaucracy that could very often be subject of putting such pressure on the media and be an object of being the source of such kinds of mishappenings. From their very nature, these broad principles cannot be treated as cast iron, absolute rules of law, rigidly applicable in all situations and under all circumstances. These are flexible general principles. The range, reach and terrain of which are the wider than those of the law. The sanction behind them is moral. The source of their motive force is within the conscience of the media person concerned. The pronouncement and directions of the council, that is the press council, activate that conscience and the principles articulated by the press council act as lights that lead and guide the journalists along the path of ethical rectitude. Compiled in a compendium titled Norms of Journalistic Conduct, they act as a reference guide in varying circumstances for the journalists. What more accurate and better way to conclude can be than the words of Mahatma Gandhi, an eminent journalist in his own right. Quote, 
the sole aim of journalism should be service the newspaper press is great power but just as unchained torrent of water submerges the whole countryside and devastates crops even so an uncontrolled pen serves but to destroy if the control is from without it proves more poisonous than the want of control it can be profitable only when exercised from within with this observation we come to the conclusion of this discussion as we have seen the topic of media ethics is a complex one while it is easy for the people the media users to complain about the media in the modern world having forgotten everything about ethics in the race to be first to report news for media persons the challenge is more tough while obviously they want to be the first to report anything they also have to ensure that there is no legal hassle or controversy after after the first news is broken then there are people's expectations and influences on the media from various quarters amidst all this is the commercial aspect as per which a media house has to be commercially viable also unlike the three pillars of democracy where the government bears the cost of supporting them that is the executive the judiciary and the legislature the press is on its own it has to earn for running itself it has to uphold its own standards and it has to uphold the standards of free speech in society and on its shoulders lies the responsibility to uphold democracy as well it is no wonder that the media often finds it difficult to play so many roles all at once in the next discussion we shall look at some mechanisms to ensure that the media maintain its credibility and code of ethics and then we'll move on to various laws that impact the working of the media industry till then my best wishes and thank you